morning, everybody. My name is Gordon Stedjink. I'm coordinator of this class. I have two announcements from Ian before we begin. The first one is that uh, membership renewal is now going on, and we hope very much that we've got your renewal coming if you haven't already done it. When you click on the renewal form, you'll see four options. Be sure you specify renewal. We don't want to even look at whether you're leaving or uh, something like that. Click renewal and then fill out the form. And it's, I even did it. So it's not too hard. The other announcement is next week, we have the summer sizzle put on by the special events committee. And let me put my glasses on, make sure I get it right. Uh, we're talking about from five to eight at the Outdoor Discovery Center on 56th Street. I hope you know how to get there. If, if you're here for a birding class, you certainly have already been to the Discovery Center. That's next week, Tuesday, July 18th. I think that's the announcements. And we welcome all of the people joining us remotely this morning. And now, make sure your seat belts are fastened. We're ready to take off for an exciting trip to Africa with Steve Hamburg. Steve did his undergraduate work at Calvin. I think I'm pronouncing that right, Steve. I'm, it's, it's, it's such an obscure school, you know, but, but we're, we, we overlook that. Anyway, he's got a PhD and an MD from the University of Kansas. He's done birding trips all over the world and uh, we're excited that he's here today. And finally, be sure you get rid of your ringers on your phones. Just take a second, do it right now, and we won't have any interruptions. Thank you very much, and here we go. Okay, I think, yep, this is working. All right. Um, my name is Steve Hamburg, and I'm a birder. And I don't know if there's any birders in this uh, audience here. I don't know if anybody wants to admit to that. But, uh, but anyway, I'm a birder. Uh, there's, there uh, are all sorts of definitions of birders. Uh, you know, some people just watch birds in their backyard uh, just watching the birds flit around in the trees, and that's good enough for them. Uh, other people actively seek out birds. Uh, they might go to the local park and try to find uh, as many different kinds of birds as they can. Uh, some people do that in their county, some people in their state, some people do that in the entire United States. And I'm one of those guys that goes around the entire world trying to see uh, as many birds as possible. So, uh, Presently, as far as I know, uh, I hold the largest world list of anyone in the state of Michigan. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and I've been to 90 countries up to this point. So, so, um, so um, how do you go about this birding business internationally? I, I'm, I know I'm going to get this question, so let me just answer it just right up front. Uh, there you could go like to uganda you could just go there yourself and look around for birds uh and uh there are a number of people that like to do that they don't like to do it in an organized manner they like to do it a lot more casually uh, but um when i go to a country i want to see as many of those birds as possible and so i sign up with a tour company there are tour, several tour companies around the world that do this uh, they take care of all the logistics. So they arrange the hotels, they arrange the transportation, they arrange to have all of your meals. 
uh, they will usually have someone from the country who is with you. Uh, and they do that for a couple of reasons. One is you might need, the country may have a law about drivers. You know, it has to be someone from the country doing the driving. The other, the other thing is, uh, if, especially in countries where they don't speak English, uh, if your hotel reservations get mixed up, well, how do you solve the, those problems? And you need somebody with you that, that can uh, deal with the systems. They know the systems. They can speak the language. And so that helps immensely. And these birding tour companies also provide a professional guide. That's his job, uh, is to know these birds. Uh, he knows them cold. He, can, he knows what they sound like. He knows where you go to find them. And so he takes you around the country because he knows the spots that you need to go to. So this is all arranged to a tour company. And all I have to do when I sign up for one of these things is try my best to see the bird. Uh, and I can get a little assistance from the, from the guides. And so I ended up seeing a whole lot more birds than I would if I had been on my own. So Uganda, why did I choose Uganda? Well, it happened that this, I went on this trip in June of 2021. Now this is during the heart of COVID. And uh, there weren't many places I could go. I had tried uh, to go to other countries and they were closed. Uh, I would uh, sign up in some places where they were still open. And within a couple of weeks, I would get a notification saying the trip has been canceled. They're not allowing tourists in their country. So Uganda in East Africa was still open. And it seemed that the countries in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, had not been affected by COVID to the same degree that a lot of other countries had been affected. And there was a theory going around that uh, the people in East Africa had maybe been exposed to some virus previously uh, that had some similarities to COVID and therefore might have had some immunity. Well, that was, that was a theory, never proven, but nevertheless, Uganda's borders were open. So uh, I chose to go to Uganda. Okay, so I'm gonna take you along on this trip. And what I like to do is I'm gonna show you what I saw. And I'm gonna go on this trip again. I'm gonna relive this trip while I'm talking to you, but I wanna take you along. So that's the idea. I want you to go on this trip with me. You, this is a, a slide of Uganda. Shows you uh, it's in Eastern Africa, surrounded by five different African countries, and uh, one of its borders uh, is Lake Victoria. Now, there's we have great lakes in Michigan. Uh, they have great lakes in Africa, too. The great lakes in Africa are more or less caused by a, a separation of the, uh, of the tectonic plates there. When those tectonic plates are separating, it causes a depression in the land, and the land now is, fills up with water. And so you have Lake Victoria, you have you have uh, Lake Albert, uh, you have uh, let's see this this one isn't labeled, but it's it's Lake George, uh, Lake Edward, and then down below you have uh, further down you've got Lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi. Those are all considered the Great Lakes of of Africa, and Uganda borders uh, several of them. Uh, it also has Lake. Kyoga in there, which is a natural lake, not part of the Great Lake system, but also uh, is a, a, a big body of water itself. Furthermore, the Nile River, the famous Nile River, begins in Lake Victoria at Uganda. And so it then will travel through Uganda, going north, it'll go through Sudan, and then eventually into Egypt and then empties into the Mediterranean. But that's where the Nile begins. We're gonna start uh, in Entebbe. Kampala is the capital city. Entebbe is where the airport is. Uh, and we're, that's where we're gonna start. So I flew into Entebbe and uh, was immediately whisked away to this hotel here. This is where our group uh, got together first. And you can see 
that uh, there's a couple of guards out front there. Uh, that's pretty common in most of the uh, hotels in Africa, uh, preventing theft. And it also uh, reduces harassment of the uh, hotel guests by the local people. So uh, I, people always say, well, when you go to these countries, you know, and, and most people here are not that familiar with going to uh, developing countries, they go, well, where do you stay? What kind of places do you stay in? So I've included a number of slides that show you where I stay. So this was my hut or my room. Nice little patio outside. And this was inside my room. Certainly not high luxury by any means, but comfortable. Next morning, uh, we're going to start out looking for the most important bird in Uganda. It's called the shoebill. You will see it. It's a unique bird, a really strange looking bird. Uh, and it has sort of become the icon of birding for Uganda. Uh, Uganda is one of the uh, best places to find this bird. It does occur a little bit in a couple other countries around Uganda, but mostly in Uganda. And so this is where we're going to start. We're going to go, like I said, looking for the most important bird right off the bat. And um, we get into boats. Oh, and I also might mention um, on this particular trip, there are six passengers. Now, normally we have a lot of British people on these trips, but uh, Britain had closed their borders to tourists. They would not allow their citizens to travel during COVID. So there were no British people. So we had three Americans. We had one German, one Swede, and one Finn. And the guide, the professional guide, was from Belgium. Okay, so here we are. We're going to head on a little boats going through this swamp. You see a lot of papyrus in these swamps, and that's what the that's what the shoebill likes to hide in. He likes these papyrus swamps. Uh, this is the same papyrus, well, similar papyrus to you remember all the the scrolls from ancient Egypt. You know, were put on papyrus scrolls. Well, they view so much of that stuff that that species of papyrus went extinct. But this uh, papyrus is related, and it looks somewhat similar. Here we are looking for the uh, the shoe bill and anything else that we can find here. That guy standing up in black in the middle of the boat, uh, he's the Belgian professional guide. Well, the boats, uh, how stable were the boats? Well, the stable boats were fairly stable. Yeah, you could stand up in them. You could see several people standing up in them, so they didn't tip over. But uh, we're in the swamp. Uh, the it's really the scenery is really beautiful. It's uh, we've got uh, water lilies, swamp grass, really, really quite pretty, very peaceful. And we saw birds like the African sacred ibis. Uh, this this is the same sacred ibis uh, that the Egyptians used to worship. They had a god. Uh, one of their gods had a head like an ibis. And if you go to Egypt, you will see that they honored the ibis uh, many times by mummifying them. And they have whole tombs that are just full of ibis mummies. Uh, but this is, this is what the ibis looked like. Uh, Long-toed lapwing. Uh, his uh, long legs uh, helping him to wade around in the shallow waters of the swamp. The lesser moorhen. Uh, this is a, a really good bird for me to find. I've been on many trips where I wanted to find this bird, uh, but we never were able to see one. But I saw several on this trip, so this was really good. We have moorhens that occasionally show up in Michigan, uh, but that's the common. That was the common moorhen, and in recent years now they've split them into the common gallinule, which lives in the Western Hemisphere and the and the moorhen, which lives in the Eastern Hemisphere. So, but anyway, this this was a good bird for me to find. Red-headed lovebird, he's a really cute little bird. He's only about six inches long, and uh, it's kind of fun to see this bird. And the great blue taraco. I then 
I love Taracos. Taracos are one of my favorite bird categories. Uh, they're big. This bird must be close to close to two feet long. Um, and they're sort of interestingly plumaged uh, and they're somewhat raucous. Um, they don't have a very pretty call, I will tell you that. But but uh, but anyway, they're kind of fun to see. All right. Another thing uh, that I'm going to tell you about bird watching uh, when you do one of these tours is you have to keep moving. Every one, two, or three days, we're moving to another place because you your idea is to see as many of the bird species as you can in the country, and uh, to do that, you 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 go to one locale, see as many birds as you can, and then you have to go to another locale because the the birds there are going to be different. And you have to keep moving around. So we're going to move around almost the entire country here. Oh, what I might say here, too, is that we had to go from Entebbe to the town of Jinja. Well, uh, I mean, if you were able to go straight there, it'd probably just take you a couple hours. But the trouble is you have to go past Kampala. And Kampala, uh, the traffic is absolutely horrendous. And uh, they don't have these four-lane highways. They're all two-lane, you know, like the same kind of road you have in your neighborhood. There's only two, road, two lanes. And uh, the traffic is just unbelievable. It's being like in Los Angeles during rush hour all the time. And so it would take about eight hours to get from Entebbe to Jinja. Our guide, the guy who's driving, knew some shortcuts in Kampala. So we're going through the weirdest places. We're going through markets and we're going down through neighborhoods and pothole roads and alleyways. And, and he cut two hours off of that. So we made it, we made it only in only six hours <laughs> to get to Jinja. Here we are. I'm going to show you just a few pictures of uh, what it looks like when you're traveling through towns. And and I want to say um, I I consider my photography to be reality photography. It's not these nice framed, beautifully apportioned pictures, you know, where they could win awards. Uh, no, I just take my point and shoot camera and point it out the window, and this is what I saw. And so uh, so some of these pictures aren't they're not the greatest, but you get the idea of what it's like to be there. This is probably typical of almost any town in Africa. Uh, it could be almost any place. Not very organized. And just to kind of give you a little by idea about how fast we're going. That's it. up a little bit for a short distance if you're coming up and you will see uh, a lot of people on motorcycles the preferred method anyway so uh we get to the, our hotel at ginger a nice place you know uh this is my room very nice view out the balcony there's lake victoria in the distance and uh, you can see um you can see the entrance of the Nile right here. That's where the Nile begins, right there. So, right there. Uh, no. Was there an option to travel by boat? No, there wasn't. And it might have been faster. Yeah, you're right. Okay, here we are uh, crossing over the Nile the next morning on the bridge. And uh, we go to the Mabira Forest. And you can see very dense vegetation, nice thick forest. We saw birds like the white-headed wood hoopoe. Oh, I didn't tell you. We had gone to, we had gone to the, the swamp to see the shoebell, and we were in that boat for five hours. We did not see one single shoe bill. And let me tell you, we were devastated because uh, this is the main bird that you need to see if you go to Africa and we did not see it. 
this was the most likely place we were going to see it, but we didn't. Now they said there is a second chance to see it uh, at a place called Murchison Falls, where we're going to go to, but it's not as good, but you still have a chance. Okay, so we we're keeping our fingers crossed. All right, so now we're in the Mabira Forest and we're seeing the wood hoopoe. The yellow mantled weaver. Now weavers are really cool birds because if you if you watch them making their nest, it's it's unbelievable work of art. They they will take pieces of grass and they'll make these circles and attach it to a branch, and then they'll make another circle and attach it to a branch, another circle, and those will be the frames. And then they'll weave grass in and out of those circles all around and make this sort of basket-like nest uh, it's just just really spectacular to watch them there's a whole family of weavers we'll see a couple of different species of them this is the yellow mantled one a black and white cast hornbill big bird he's about two three feet long and this is a special bird did you have a question Did I learn the call of the birds? I did not get them on the in the slides. So unfortunately, thank you. <laughs> uh, this bird has special significance for me for this was my bird species number 7,000. I mean, it's a pretty bird, but this, but for me, this will always hold a special place in my heart for this, this bird. The red-headed malimbe. All right, so now we're going to move on to uh, a place. Well, we're going to have a hotel in Soroti, but we're really going to want to go bird watching near Maroto. You see that near the Kenya border. Um, there is a only one bird in Uganda that is endemic. And what that means, an, an endemic species means it only occurs in that country. So uh, there's only one bird endemic to Uganda, and that is a bird called the fox's weaver. And the fox's weaver is a, has some strange habits. It will live in an area for maybe two, three, four years, and then suddenly disappear from that area, only to show up in another area someplace else. Um, so the year before, uh, the birding company had discovered that there was a fox's weaver group living near Maroto, so they tried to bring their group there to see that bird, but um, the local people there being sort of rural and they not really having seen many foreigners and it being COVID time, uh, they were not happy that these foreigners were showing up. Uh, some of them were uh, worried about uh, these foreigners coming to take their land. And uh, so they actually um, raised such a fuss that the bird group felt that for safety reasons they had to leave and they never saw the bird so we're going to try again uh but this time we we have uh, managed to get uh someone who lives in that area and uh, they have coached this guy on what we're doing and why we're there and we're going to take him along so that he can explain that to the local people uh, the local people will know will know him and so we we'll hope that that will settle all the issues. So here we are. It's, it's, we're in a much more rural setting here, you can see. People have asked me, what that sign there, what does that mean? Well, it means that the speed limit was 50 kilometers an hour, which is about 30 miles an hour. The, the speed limit was 50 miles an hour, 50 kilometers an hour, but those lines through the sign mean that that speed limit has ended now. So now you can go whatever speed you want, sort of. They had some pretty nice houses out here. Arriving at the hotel, my room, the maze in the back 40 of the hotel that I, we won't talk about my me getting lost uh, during the middle of the night uh, in, the, in the maze we, we won't talk about that um 
So next morning we set out uh, heading towards uh, Moroto, Moroti. And um, this is just the typical scene that you often see on the roads in the morning. Uh, many of these people along the roads are school children and they're heading to school. See, they're all walking. And, um, and some of them may have a job someplace and they're walking to work. And other people are just out. It's a good time of the day to travel because it's not that hot yet. And they're just going to go visit someone else. So it's very common to see people walking along the road. And motorbikes are a common um, means of transportation. Uh, motorbikes are certainly a lot cheaper than cars. Uh, and you can put two or three people on the, on the motorbike. And if you have kids, I have seen as many as six on one motorbike they just put a two by four or a board on the back to extend it out and they put a kid on one side and another side and then a couple in the back and then one between mom and dad and the front it's amazing <laughs> what they can do but motorbikes are very common here and we got to our spot we had absolutely no trouble so we were very grateful about that and we saw birds here like the yellow longbill The Caramoja apolis. Now, the Caramoja apolis is a is a very range restricted bird, and by that mean I mean that if you look at a map that shows you the range of where this bird lives, it's a, just a little tiny little spot on the map. And so that's he's one of these birds. So if you, it was great that we got to go here because we got to see this bird. Dwarf bittern, another very difficult to find bird. Um, I've been on a lot of trips where dwarf bittern was possible. You never see him. But uh, this dwarf bittern, we flushed him out of the swamp and he flew up onto a branch and basically posed for us. Just amazing. And this is the fox's weaver. But we got to see him. He lives in those thorns. Look at the size of those thorns on that on that uh, bush. That's the kind of habitat that he lives in. You know, when I, when I lived, I lived in Swaziland for four years. And I remember one year I went to a national park when there was a, the habitat was where they had a lot of thorns like that. And for some reason, the following year uh, in, in my car, I had 12 flat tires. <laughs> 12. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to go on to uh, Murchison Falls, which is up just above Lake Elbert. Getting there, some scenes along the way. You can see this is common too to see these ladies sitting alongside the road selling things you see a little pile of mangoes you see a little pile of bananas you see a little pile of coconuts you know and someone driving along they get thirsty you can just stop instead of getting a coke you just you buy a coconut and the the, the vendor will take his machete and lop off the top of it and you can drink straight from the from the coconut Probably playing cards here. And you can tell it's mango season. Crossing the Nile again. And we get to Murchison Falls National Park. And, you know, Murchison Falls is, is world famous, you know, and it's, it's one of the premier tourist spots for Uganda. And somehow I expected a lot more spectacular entrance. <laughs> but this was it. Um, okay, so we go in and we pay our entrance fees. And this, by the way, is the, the vehicle that we're traveling around in uh, the whole country. It's a glorified Land Rover. Uh, it's extended in the back so it can hold up to 10 people in this uh, Land Rover. But uh, that four-wheel drive and the high carriage came in handy a number of times. Once we got inside the park, the roads were absolutely fantastic. I mean, nobody on them, but the roads are fantastic inside the park. 
and some of the local residents along the road. And, you know, when in Rome, you do as the local residents do. So we did the same thing. Here we are birding. And uh, every so often we would take a little path through the forest, seeing what else we could see. And one time we came up upon this. I don't know if, does anybody have any idea why these butterflies are congregating here? More or less, uh, you're close. Uh, there, uh, uh, some animal has urinated at this spot. And urea, which is a big ingredient in urine, is something that is very desired by butterflies. And so they're lapping up as much as that as they can get. And I'm sorry if I spoiled your lunch. <laughs> All right, so... Here we get to the, this is the Nile River, uh, about to go over Murchison Falls here. And uh, just to kind of give you an idea. Right? Now, it had been heavy rain in the month of May, June. So the water is higher than normally would be. And our African guy that was with us that he had never seen the water this hot. And then we get another one. Notice the safety pen. Notice the sign saying don't get close to the water. Notice the park guards that are trying to keep people from killing themselves in the water. You would never see this in the U.S. The obligatory picture in front of the falls. This is where the water goes over the edge. I don't think we have a can on that water. And then downstream. going in front of the camera. Anyway, it was impressive. And we drove on to our lodge there at uh, Murchison Falls. My room again. Um, they gave us strict instructions. Do not leave the sliders open because the baboons are just waiting for an opportunity. And I remember on one of my Kenya trips, there was one of our members who didn't pay attention to the warning. And we went out birding and we came back and his room was like a tornado had gone through it. Everything was absolutely torn apart. Uh, you know, it was just a disaster. And having remembered that, I decided that I would obey the rules here. <laughs> They had a nice patio overlooking the uh, the river and watched the sunset there, and you could hear the hippos calling in the distance. Uh, it was really quite pleasant. And next morning, we're going to go on a boat ride on the river, and those are not real hippos in the grass. And we're going to look for the shoe bill one more time. Uganda has a lot of hippos. Uh, these are cattle egrets. Uh, they like to hang around on the hippos because the, as the hippos go through the vegetation, insects which are in the vegetation will fly up. And then the cattle egrets will get them. So it makes a real good relationship for the cattle egrets to hang out uh, around bigger animals. They like hippos, especially because they make good perches. And we saw a fish eagle, fish eagle up in the tree there. Uh, that is uh, the equivalent uh, of the American bald eagle. Uh, it uh, lives around rivers and lakes and eats fish. We saw here the yellow bittern. This is another rare bird that, that I had looked for years to find and didn't find it.
but no shoe bill. We spent another four hours on the, so now we spent nine hours on the, on the, on the river looking for shoe bill, could not find one. So we're, we're talking about what we should do because it's just not acceptable to leave, to leave Uganda and not see a, sh a shoe bill. Well, um, our African guide said, well, look, uh, the water is really high and the shoe bills like to hang out on the mud banks and there are no mud banks here. So that's probably why they're not on the river. So he said, well, look, why don't we leave the national park and just drive along the road because there are marshes here and there along the road and maybe we'll happen upon a shoe bill that has moved a little further inland. Okay, made sense to us. So we left the national park and we had only been 10 minutes out of the national park and we saw this family of elephants and we hadn't seen elephants yet. So, all right. So we stopped and watched them as they're feeding there in the, in the marsh. And uh, all of a sudden one of the, the elephants moved aside and there was a shoe bell. Huh. Let me tell you, there were some high fives, some hooting and hollering and general overall celebration. That, that shoe bell is the weirdest looking bird you've ever seen. Stands about, oh, roughly four foot tall, has this huge bill. And he uses that bill to eat large fish. So, you know, the herons have this smaller bill and they, they, there is a limit to the size fish that they can get. Well, this bird, this bird can get a lot bigger fish than they can get. So those, those fish are reserved for him. This is a little bit closer look. If you look, you can see this little hook on the end of its, on the tip of its bill. And he uses that to hang on to the fish because the fish are slippery. And, uh, and he's got this cute little crest in the back that sort of makes up for his general overall ugliness. <laughs> yeah, question. Uh, is there a relation to the dodo bird? No, I don't think so. Uh, the dodo was is related to pigeons, and uh, this is related to herons. Uh, definitely, yes. <laughs> but a great bird to see. I mean, it, it's so unique. I mean, again, you can see why we were so disappointed in not finding this bird, because it's such an interesting bird. Just one. That's it. That's up. That we only saw one. We didn't see a bunch. No, they they usually hang out separately, um, but usually they say they might see two, three, four, five, six along the rivers, and they saw none. We saw none on the rivers. Well, now that we've seen the shoe bell, we've got time to explore the rest of Murchison National Park, and they have some grassland plains. So on the plains, you have a lot of the same kind of animals that you have in a lot of the East African countries. So we're seeing uh, a number of giraffe. If you kind of look hard, I've managed to capture a couple of warthogs in the right-hand side of that picture. These, these, these giraffe had some kind of skin problem. I'm not sure if it was mange or what it was, but little potus monkey on a termite hill. A uh, dick dick, which is a small antelope. He only stands about 18 inches at the shoulder. And this group of Cape buffalo were cooling themselves off in the water. You know, the, the temperatures here often were in the uh, high 80s to high 90s. So it was relatively warm. And uh, I'm sure these buffalo were enjoying the middle of the day in the water instead of out of the water. You can see some sacred ibis in the foreground. And when lunchtime would come, this is how we would often have lunch. We, you know, often you're, you've driven quite a ways from the restaurant or the lodge. And so to take the time to go all the way back and then drive back again is, uh, just taking up way too much time. So we usually bring our food with us 
And lunchtime comes, we spread a towel out on the hood and fix ourselves a meal. Some of the environment here. Come across a forested section. And we saw birds like beautiful sunbird. And that's its name, beautiful sunbird. But you can see why they named them that. Sunbirds uh, have some similarities to hummingbirds. So in the Western Hemisphere, you will find hummingbirds. There's, we only have one species of hummingbird in Michigan, but in the, in the whole Western Hemisphere, North America, uh, Central America, South America, there are about 350 uh, species of hummingbirds. Uh, you won't find any in the Eastern Hemisphere, but you find a whole raft of species of sunbird. And they drink nectar just like the hummingbirds do. They do not have that wing structure that the hummingbirds have. So they can't do the hovering flight, but they do more normal flight like a regular bird does. Yellow-fronted tinkerbird, kind of a cute bird. Uh, it's about the size of a sparrow. And the chocolate-backed kingfisher. Say so that back it reminded somebody of chocolate. So. Butterflies were common. All right, now we're going to go to another spot further inland. And you see it had been raining. So on the windshield, as I take my reality pictures, Outside the, through the windshield, you can see the raindrops. Here's a, they, they had a, an election in 2021. And so that you saw a lot of election posters. This is uh, Mr. Museveni, he's up for re-election. He has been president of Uganda since 1986, so 37 years. Now, there are rumors that Mr. Museveni is somewhat corrupt. I don't know about that. I do know that uh, he eliminated at one point uh, term limits on the president. And to get that bill passed in parliament, he paid all the par parliament members who would support that measure $2,000. Just say it. market and our hotel there my room you can see the wonderful cooling system up there on the wall and uh, keep the mechanism to keep the mosquitoes off at night but we're, this place is called the royal mile and uh, back in the day of the ugandan kings the, the king would have this grand procession down this road, and he would travel about a mile to where there's a creek. And in the creek, they would have uh, some type of ritual. And I can't tell you any of the details of the ritual because I don't know. But then, they, but then they would come back, and that was part of the culture of the, of the Ugandan people. <clears throat> well, they don't do that anymore. However... Uh, because of its historical significance, they have preserved this area as a national park. And because they have preserved it, the forest is pretty good, and it's a good place to go birding. We saw birds like the African emerald cuckoo. Stunning bird. I mean, that green is iridescent, and it just shimmers as he turns his body. It's just a beautiful bird. Unfortunately, he's a cuckoo. I don't know. Um, are any of you familiar with how cowbirds operate in the in the U.S.? Cowbirds do not raise their own young. They raise their they they lay their eggs in other birds' nests, and then when that egg hatches, the baby is programmed to throw the other eggs or other babies out of the nest. So that it's the only chick left in the nest, and that bird who built the nest doesn't know the difference. And so he will raise that chick as though it's his own. 
And, and if you watch birds long enough, you will sometimes see like a little bitty chipping sparrow about that long, feeding a cowbird chick about that long. It's the weirdest thing, but, uh, but that's what cowbirds do. And I can't say I like cowbirds very much, but that's what cuckoos do too. This is a Fraser's Rufus thrush. They do have brown birds there too. The lowland mast Apples. Okay, moving on. You can see another one of my great reality pictures. I wasn't sure whether to include this or not, but I did. And uh, this is the next place we stayed. The room, the front yard. Well, we're going to go looking for a, a bird called the green-breasted pitta here. Uh, very sought-after bird. There's only there's two species of pittas in the entire continent of Africa, and one of them is next to impossible to find ever. Uh, and this one is pretty hard too, but at least it's a little bit more doable. So a lot of bird watchers will come here to try to at least see that family of birds uh, somewhere. Um, we went here in the whole morning. We were we worked uh, trying to get this bird and we couldn't find it. We did, however, run across a family of chimpanzees. And this is one of the cool things about this particular uh, park is that they have wild chimpanzees. And uh, the chimpanzees have become used to seeing people come around and they, they weren't terribly happy that we were there. They were somewhat annoyed and uh, they would even do this on us, <laughs> I think out of spite. Um, anyway, we didn't have any success in the in the morning and so we tried to to do something else in the afternoon and we just went birding along the roadside no you uh, do we sit in one spot for a long time uh occasionally but mostly we walk and we're walking the whole time so we're walking the road we'll we'll be in a spot for maybe i don't know 15 20 minutes maybe and then we'll move on and we'll find another spot we just keep moving around. So birds like the black bee eater. And this is a this is another absolutely beautiful bird. This this picture just doesn't capture the the beauty of it. It's uh that blue, that light blue is iridescent also, and it just shimmers. Just really beautiful. Crested guinea fowl. <laughs> Some of you may have seen the helmeted guinea fowl, which uh, some of the people uh, that have exotic birds raise like chickens here in the U.S. Uh, but this is the crested guinea fowl and much, much less common. Kind of a strange looking bird. <laughs> and the yellow bellied waxbill, kind of a cute bird. Well, we're gonna make another stab at looking for that green-breasted pitta. And um, after a couple of hours, we decided uh, that we needed to take a different tact. Uh, we had uh, our professional guide, we had our African guide and the park ranger had to be with us all the time. Um, so the, those guys decided that maybe there were too many people and that we were just scaring the bird. So they said, okay, we, we want you to sit in one spot and stay there. And we'll spread out and we'll look around uh, individually for this bird, one, one by one. And if we find one, we'll call to you. Okay, so that's what we did. So we stayed in this spot for about an hour. And uh, pretty soon we got a call. And uh, we went running. Now, you remember the brush is fairly thick and you're having to swim through the branches and, and jump over all of the, the logs that are falling on the ground and trying not to trip in the vines and, and rushing there. And sure enough, we saw the green-breasted pitta. 
kind of a pretty bird. Very difficult to find. He, he, he likes to hide. He doesn't come out easy. But managed to get a picture of him. Oh, while I'm watching this bird, uh, I suddenly came to the realization that the glasses that were on my face when I started the run were no longer on my face. And knowing what kind of terrain we had just come through, there wasn't a hope that I would go be able to go back and look for my glasses. My glasses were gone. Uh, fortunately, I brought a spare pair along, so we're okay. All right, now we'll move uh, down around Lake Edward. Well, you can, uh, the names of the lakes were made during the time of Queen Victoria. So you have, Queen, you have Lake Victoria, you have Albert, which was her consort, and Lake Edward and Lake George. English, English is an official language in Uganda. Uh, they also use a number of other languages and it was recently, in the last couple of years, that they decided to make Swahili another official language. Now they don't speak Swahili in the country, uh, but they're going to because other Eastern countries speak Swahili and so then they will be able to communicate. I didn't notice the sign on this wind on this shop. If I had, maybe I could have gotten my glasses replaced, <laughs> but unfortunately I didn't. This is how you transport your cows. And we crossed the equator and I was sort of amazed at that this is all there was. There's no there's no lights, no music, no fanfare, just some simple little sign there. But we cross the equator. Lake Edward in the distance, some of the hills around there. And we entered Queen Elizabeth National Park. Uh, it's in 1952, uh, queen Elizabeth, who wasn't quite queen yet, got the message that her father had just passed away, and that meant she was now queen of England, and she got that message at this spot. And so they have subsequently named the park Queen Elizabeth National Park. Now, you also see that we're in two Land Rovers here now. Well, while we're at the Royal Mile, uh, that evening, uh, the president of the country got on the television and announced that they had had an unexpected rise in the number of COVID cases. And so they were going to institute restrictions. And those restrictions were what I consider fairly severe for the people. Um, they uh, were going to close down all the public schools. In a few days, they were going to close down all public transportation. Uh, they, uh, you could, you could travel in a car, but you could only have four people in a car because you had to be socially distanced. Uh, you could only have one person on a motorbike, which was really going to cut down on travel. Uh, and you could not cross county lines. So you had to make a decision. Uh, if you had a job in one county and you lived in another country, county, you had to decide whether you're going to live at work or whether you were going to go home and not have work for as long as they had the restrictions. Fortunately, uh, you pay a, you pay going to Uganda is not cheap and a lot of the extra money that you're paying actually gets funneled into the government and they like those tourist dollars. So they exempted tourists. So we didn't have to obey those restrictions, but we weren't sure about this four people in a car business. So since there was eight of us, uh, we 
got two vehicles. And you had to wear a mask in your vehicle at all times, uh, which was a, somewhat of a trial. And uh, they had police checks everywhere. So when you got on the road, you were pretty guaranteed that at some point during the day, maybe even several times a day, getting checked by the police to make sure that you were complying with the regulations. Going into Queen Elizabeth uh, National Park, uh, here is the, the lodge, main lodge, and inside had this sort of colonial feel to it. It was kind of cool, actually. My room. Next day, we're out looking for birds and animals. And we came across Ugandan cob, K-O-B, Ugandan cob. Uh, they are very similar to impala, except you can see that they have a lot more white on their bodies, and they're slightly larger than the impala. Elephants, all kinds of elephants. This area uh, is known for its past volcanic activity. You can see this crater uh, there down in the hill there, and there, there is some water in the crater bed. There's a flock of white-backed vultures hanging about in the trees. Hippos, more hippos. Got back to the lodge and there's a group of banded mongoose raiding the, uh, the uh, trash can. Well, it was quite pleasant that afternoon. We actually had lunch at the hotel and the, the chef there is, was second to none. The, the food there is, was excellent. And it was pleasant up there, nice little breeze up there on top of the hill overlooking Lake Edward. And we're next to the pool. And we were thinking a little bit about just staying there for the afternoon. But no, the plan said you got to go for a boat ride. So we're going to go for a boat ride again. And we left, we left the bank and there's all these holes uh, in, the, in the sand here. And those are homes to the pied kingfisher. I've never seen so many pied kingfishers in my life. There were hundreds of them. And didn't go much further. And we saw this animal on shore, weren't sure what it was. And so we got a little closer. Tur turned out it's a giant forest hog. I had, didn't even know this animal existed before I saw one. Uh, bigger than a warthog. He's probably at, at, least, at least twice the size of a normal warthog. And the warts on his face are huge. It's a spur wing lap wing there in front of the warthog. Spotted hyena. Cape buffalo. Elephants, more elephants. Just to give you an idea of the density of, of animals here, I just ran a video. Listen to the sound of the tusks. But uh, there, there were quite a few animals trying to stay out of the sun. Defaz's water buck. More elephants. And we came across a pair of fish eagles copulating. Talk about timing. And there's a whole raft of African skimmers on the bank here. Uh, skimmers are kind of cool birds. They're, they, uh, the bottom mandible is longer than the upper mandible. And so how they feed is they will fly real close to the surface of the water and they will drop that lower mandible into the water like they're trolling. And if their lower mandible hits a little fish that's come to the surface, bam, they've got them. They eat, they have their they have their lunch. 
Well, when we got close here, uh, they, they this group flushed. So it's quite a spectacle to see all those birds in the air. Here's a, a group of uh, African skimmers on the bank, a few pied kingfishers, and this great big tall bird there is a Goliath heron. Goliath heron, a guy stands about five feet tall. I mean, it's huge, huge heron. Yeah, flies. It flies well, it flies a lot like a great blue heron. You've probably seen the big great blue herons. Yes, the wings are big. And we saw a few of these guys. African uh, white pelicans. And then you see those pelicans and then to the right a little bit, you see a couple of great cormorants. And then in the center, this beautiful looking marabou stork. Well, uh, maybe beautiful isn't the right adjective, uh, but uh, I want to point out a couple of features. Um, he gets into eating dead things uh, from time to time, so that he has that bald head a lot like vultures do, so the the bacteria don't get uh, too thick on his scalp. Um, he's got this interesting pouch there on his neck uh and a red spot on the back of his neck those are sexual characteristics and he's sitting down he's not standing up he's sitting down you see his 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 legs are bent and his legs are normally medium gray but in this picture you can see they're white and the reason for that is is that when it's hot out the, their cooling system involves defecating on their legs. So if anybody have had the great misfortune to be under a bird when it has defecated, uh, you know it's this thick, oily, liquidy substance. And he will then defecate onto his legs, and that liquid begins to evaporate and provides cooling. So that's part of the cooling system of the, these birds. Interesting. Again, I'm sorry if I spoiled your lunch. <laughs> uh, big uh, volcanic craters, and, the, and now the whole grassland has developed in the base of this crater. Birding, here we saw African crake. Blue-breasted quail, Nubian woodpecker, and southern red bishop. Some of you may have seen this bird. If you see these aviaries around, this is a favorite bird to put in the in the aviary because of its colors. Sunset over Lake Edward. And now we're going to leave the park. And on the way out, we see a few topi. Big, those are good size antelope. And now it's lunchtime, and we pulled off uh, someplace. There was a little park uh, alongside the road, and we pulled off. And this is real close to the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo. You see that river in the distance. Uh, that on the other side of the river is the Democratic Republic of Congo. So that's how close we are to the border. Had lots of hippos here again. And you can see one poor, unfortunate hippo had gotten into an altercation with another one, ripped his side open. And I don't know how that hippo will do, but hopefully it does OK. And I took a picture of those hippos on the other side of the river because you can see barely but the heads of little oxpecker birds poking up along the backs of these hippos. These oxpecker birds are related to starlings and they will go around 
on the skin of the animal picking off parasites, especially ticks. They love ticks. And uh, so they, they eat ticks and whatever else, whatever other insects they can find. And there's this love-hate relationship with a lot of the animals. Uh, they, the animals seem to realize that they're, the birds are doing them a favor, but it's kind of a nuisance having them on, the, on their backs as well. So anyway, works out for the birds. And there was a nearby group of open-billed storks. This open bill, you can just barely see it on this picture, but he's when he closes his bill, it's not totally closed. The, the top and the bottom sort of round, are rounded. So he eats mostly snails and clams and big snails. And so with that kind of a structure of a bill, he can it's much easier to pick up and to hold on to those mollusks like that. And now we're gonna go, this is the next place we're staying. Kind of a nice place. They had this great little balcony over uh, on the patio uh, overlooking the forest. And just from the balcony, we saw these birds. Collared sunbird, black hooded oriole. And here's another one of those taracos. Uh, this is Ross's taraco. And, uh, you know, just look at the plumage on that thing. I mean, it's striking. Big bird again, about two feet long. Uh, we we're staying at this place because it's right by the Windy Impenetrable Forest National Park. Now, the Impenetrable Forest uh, is one of the great strongholds of the gorilla. And so a lot of tourists come here. In fact, when we got here uh, this morning, we had to wait for two hours while the guards processed the 30 foreigners that had come to visit the gorillas. And uh, finally, after they got done with that, then we were able to go birding. And uh, they call it the impenetrable forest for two reasons. One, the, the underbrush is especially dense. And the second thing is uh, it's so hilly that it makes it difficult to go from one spot to another. And occasionally on our trips, it rained. And when you're out there, there's no place to go. So everybody carries an umbrella or a rain jacket. So when it rains, we just get our rain gear out and wait it out. Usually the rains don't last more than an hour. Here we saw birds like narrow-tailed starling, blue-headed sunbird. This bed, this sunbird has a lot longer bill, so he he can get into deeper flowers. Luter's bush shrike, and another one of those butterfly congregations. Look at how many different species of butterfly there are there all going for that urea. Okay, I took this off the internet. <laughs> now, in 1985, okay, we're talking a few years ago, I was in the Democratic Republic of Congo and went with some trackers to find gorillas. And we had come across a family of gorillas and we even had the experience where this big silverback male charged us, which was rather exciting. Um, well, I had already seen gorillas, and uh, therefore I had some reluctance to pay the $700 it cost for half a day to go see the gorillas. And besides, uh, that meant I would not have the opportunity to see as many bird species as possible. So. I went, half our group went birding, and the other half went to see the gorillas. And the half that went to see the gorillas actually saw them and were very satisfied with their, uh, their experience. Saw uh, the dusky long-tailed cuckoo. This bird, I, 
I'd heard this bird many times, but managed finally to get a picture of him. And the Willard's City Boo Boo. Don't you love that name? Boo Boo. <laughs> There's several different Boo Boos. This is the Willard's City Boo Boo. Now we're back together again. I had some questions about the integrity of this bridge. The railing seems to be having a little trouble. And I took this picture because uh, look at the size of this earthworm. I mean, I, I put somebody's boot in there just so you had a reference for scale. This thing is huge. Go fishing with that once. Wow. All right, we're going to go looking for another very special bird. It's called the uh, Grower's uh, Broadbill, also known as the African Green Broadbill. Um, and it's a very range restricted bird and uh, difficult to find. So we're going to go looking for it. Now, the only thing is we have to go downhill to find it. Well, downhill is not so bad. Uh, except it's not just downhill, it's 2,000 feet downhill, okay? And the trail was not particularly good. It was a little muddy, a little rocky. It had a lot of fallen branches on it, lots of vines. It was not the easiest going down there. And with every step I took, I realized I was going to have to take another step coming back up at some point. 2,000 feet is a long way, and if you want to get that into perspective, that's about the same distance as a 200-story building. So the Empire State Building is 100 stories, so twice the distance of the Empire State Building. Beautiful in the morning, all the steam rising off the hills, and we got to see the Grower's Broadbill. Well, we decided to do the same thing that we had done for the green-breasted pittas, that the, we had trackers that went looking around for the, the bird, and then they would call us when they saw the bird. So we would call, and, and just like before, the, the vegetation was extremely dense, and darn, darn it all, it was always uphill for some reason. So you had, And you had to get there as fast as you could because... If you didn't get there fast enough, the bird would be gone and someplace else. So we did this about four or five times. And uh, I'm getting pretty tired at this point. Uh, and we finally got to this, this place where the bird hung around long enough to see him. And I raised my binoculars to look at this bird, except I couldn't hold my binoculars still. My legs were just shaking because they were so weak. And, and, and I was breathing so hard. But I got a naked eye view of this bird, so I did see the bird. And then we walked another 45 minutes downhill to this swamp. And uh, it was said that elephants come to this swamp uh, from time to time to eat, uh, but we didn't see any. But it looked like a good place to have lunch, and we had hired a couple of local people to carry our lunch material so they bro broke out the, the the sandwiches and the and the pop and we sat and had lunch at this spot and we did see this bird the grower swamp warbler which is another range restricted bird so it, it was good that we were there all right back uphill oh man that was an effort but uh, we took it slow and finally got there just uh, traveling along the roadside. Every so often, we would just stop and see what uh, what birds can we find just by stopping along the roadside. And we found birds like the cr dusky crimson wing, uh, beautiful little finch-like bird. The regal sunbird. And the strange weaver. And don't ask me why he's called strange, because he didn't seem that strange to me. <laughs> But uh, the strange weaver. Casson's hawk eagle overhead. 
and I'll go down to the very tip, Uganda. Stayed at this place, didn't look like much, and it's raining. But this was my living room, and this was my bedroom. You know, nice little flowers on the on the towels. You know, really, actually, quite luxurious. But we were mainly mainly going to go to the Gahinga Gorilla National Park. They they do have silverback gorillas there, and they have the golden backed colobus monkeys. However, we didn't see either one of those. Uh, it's another volcanic area, and this particular volcano last erupted, if I'm right, somewhere around 2004. Fortunately, it wasn't erupting at the time we were there. Saw birds like Mountain Buzzard, the Ruinzori Sunbird, and the Yellow Crown Canary. And another one of those fabulous Taracos, the Ruinzori Taraco. Uh, this was the star bird. This is the bird we were looking for. And uh, we saw him at the very last minute. All right, last stop. You can see uh, Uganda is quite lush. And, you know, the British uh, had control of Uganda for uh, a number of years from the 1890s to the 1960s. And they had thought that Uganda would be one of their premier, premier countries because it's so fertile and it has mining uh, and it uh, has oil and they thought it was gonna be one of their best countries. Well, it now is one of the poorest countries in Africa. Uh, but it's probably more a problem of number one, government is uh, not very efficient. And second, uh, the culture uh, doesn't really push people to achieve. They, they only are living from day to day. So uh, they really haven't achieved that uh, point that the British had hoped that they would. They have some nice roads. They're probably built by the Chinese. Well, we got to our last place and there the staff is waiting for us. And they promptly inspected our garbage. This is where I stayed. And we would go on another boat ride. See more hippos. But one of the birds we were looking for was this guy. And I took a quick picture of it. It's not that great, but the, the, the bird was moving. And I'm lucky to get it. This is uh, the African finfoot. This is a better picture of it. That's when it's in the water. And this is what it looks like when it's out of the water. It's got huge feet. And he has little fins on his toes that uh, act sort of like webs. So when he's in the water, that helps him to paddle. So that's why they call him the finfoot. Zebra, topi, Ugandan cob, giant eland. This, this antelope is huge. Stands about five to six feet tall at the shoulder. Just huge. And people always ask me, when you go to Africa, do you see snakes? Well, usually I don't. Uh, snakes don't like to come out uh, in the open uh, and you never see them. But this time we saw this python, this rock python along the side of, of the road. And we stayed out late this night and uh, there are some birds that come out at night. You know, we have some night birds too, the, the uh, night hawk. Sometimes you hear that night hawk calling over the downtown Holland. Uh, and uh, the whippoorwill, but uh, this is related. This is, they're all in the night jar family. 
this is the pennant wing night jar and he has these spectacular feathers that trail out behind him uh, while he uh, flies along. Okay, now we're gonna head out of the park. Uh, just leaving the park, we came across this, the, uh, these Ancoli cattle. Look at the massive horns on these cattle, just big. And the people that own these are just immensely proud of these cattle. Heading back toward Kampala. I think we had, what, 13 police checks between that last park and Kampala, checking to make sure we were complying with the regulations. More Mr. Museveni signs. And you couldn't leave Uganda without getting a COVID test. You had to have a negative test in order to be allowed to get on the airplane. So they had so they had tents in the nearby hospital, and you'd go there and you'd pay your 200 US dollars to get a COVID test, but if you didn't pay that, you didn't get on the plane. So we paid it. So that we did that. We all passed our test, and that was it. The end. So okay, any. So if anybody has any questions, I'll try to answer them. Yes. Oh, whew. what other African countries have I birded in? You know, I've never counted them up, but it must be close to 20. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. Where were the other Americans from? Uh, uh, one was from California and was, one was from New Jersey. Yeah. I'm wondering what kind of camera you have. Uh, uh, I have a little point and shoot Nikon camera that I keep on, on my belt. And that's that's all I have. Uh, I, like I said, I'm I'm just taking pictures so I can tell a story, and I'm not trying to get really spectacular pictures. Yeah. What's the population of that shoe bill? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. It's not it's not real high. I would guess on the order of a few thousand. Yeah. Uh, I will say the pictures in here. I took all of the landscape and people pictures and building pictures. But many of the bird pictures are not mine. Uh, I have often borrowed pictures from other passengers that have been on the trip. You know, we make a deal at the end, and uh, occasionally I will get pictures off the internet. But those are birds that we did see. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, here, here comes a microphone. What was the mileage that you took around the country? Because oh, you seemed to go. I have no idea. But it, what would it? But we were there for three weeks. Okay. And we're tra and we're moving every, every every what one to three days. Uganda might be about the size of what state in the U.S. Do you know? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that, but I would guess maybe something like Kentucky or Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. Did you always feel safe? Yeah, when you were there. Yeah, we did. Uh, the only time where there came into question was that one time where we had to take somebody along who would maybe answer the questions. But uh, I, we feel, we usually are pretty safe on these trips. Um, usually, you have uh, an African guy with you who knows there are places you need to stay out of, and he keeps you out of those places. So that's really not generally an issue. Yeah. So. Steve, is, yes. is part of your preparation for this trip, when you sign up, are there things they want you to do, like make sure you're in good physical shape, or do, you, do they require you to say, oh, are you exercising? Because if something happens, obviously some of those treks were pretty uh, treacherous. They were, so. Yes, and they yeah. were fairly strenuous. Yes. Uh, yes. They don't, they, they will tell you ahead of time yeah. that there's, there are some difficult parts on here, and that that you should be in good physical shape to do them. You can opt out. So you do, So if you're in somewhat uh, good enough shape to go on the rest of it, but can't do those 
hard parts, they allow you to opt out and you just sit in the hotel. Uh, yeah. There are um, sometimes I've, I know some of these professional guys, he, can't, he had uh, one trip that he was going on to New Guinea, which involves a lot of up and down, up and down. And a, and a guy showed up in a walker using a walker <laughs> and, and they just plain told him, uh, we can't take you. And they had to send them back. So as part of the tour um, lecture series, like you discuss the birds or is that little segments at, at that? night, at night, sometimes at night, we do. Yeah. at night when we're around the dinner table, the, the guide knows a lot about these birds. And so we ask questions and some of this information gets passed back and forth. Uh, yeah. So, and I do some of that on my own too. Yeah. So. Good. Thank you. Yes. Yellow fever vaccine. Do we need yellow fever vaccines? Well, it depends. As some countries you do. I, and I have had a yellow fever vaccine. Interestingly, um, I went to Angola last year and uh, they required a yellow fever vaccine. And I hadn't had one for like 12 years. Okay. And they used to be good for 10 years. So I went to the health department. They said, uh, the rules have changed. You don't, if you've had one yellow fever shot ever, you don't need another one anymore. So, so anyway, I had my certificate. It got me into the country. Yeah. Steve, uh, you mentioned you coaxed the dwarf bittern out. Can yeah. you explain what you mean by coax? And do you use what? any kind of bird calling and what your stands on the ethics of that? Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't know that we coaxed it out. I think just by being close to it, it was in the grass, and us just walking on the road, we didn't know it was there, and it flushed. And so that's really, if I use the word coaxed, it, uh, I didn't mean to use that word. Yeah. What are your thoughts on those who use bird calls to attract or to get a better shot well, of? Well, bird? I will say that for a lot of the birds, we do use the bird calls. Uh, because uh, if you don't, you won't have much of a chance of seeing those birds. If you play a bird's call to it, especially during mating season, uh, that bird will be very either inquisitive or aggressive about someone else coming into his territory. And so he will come to investigate and want to drive that other bird out. And he's, they come and they're looking around for that bird and they can't find it. Um, some people consider that unethical. Uh, I don't. I mean, it, this, it's a situation that they experience every day in their lives anyway, you know, as long as you don't overdo it. I have been to some places where it's the only place you can see that bird, and so many birders have come there that they will put up a sign saying, no bird calls. I was at, uh, I was in the outback of Australia. Uh, a few weeks ago, and and there was a place where we would see the a bird called the noisy scrub bird. Well, it's about the only place in the world you can go to see this bird. And I I had my own bird call and I played it. And as soon as I played it, that bird shut up, and he didn't call again for another forty five minutes. So I knew that forget it. We can't you can't use that technique here. So that can be overdone. But generally, I think uh, birds, it doesn't, it stresses the bird maybe a little bit, but not, but again, it's something he experiences every day of his life. So. Steve, uh, great talk. Um, and I'm distracting you here a little bit. I remember a talk you gave years ago, one of your South American trips. This relates to safety. Tell us briefly about when you were held up. Oh, yeah. Uh, great story. <laughs> I was in Guatemala one year and uh, we were traveling along and we uh, were going into the capital city, Guatemala city. And they, and they had decided that it was on that day, they were gonna finally repair a bridge that had been damaged by a hurricane like several months previous. So we came along and the traffic is backed up for miles. So our guy, our guy who's driving decides he's going to take a different route. And so he takes a different route, but it was way longer than he ever planned on. And we didn't get around back to the main road 
till well after dark. And as we got back to the main road, uh, we decided to stop at a gas station for restrooms and snacks, uh, something to drink. And, and then we got back on the road and we're going up this mountain and this pickup truck slowly comes alongside of us and suddenly cuts in front of us and puts on his brakes. And so our driver put on his brakes to stop. And as soon as we stopped, four guys got out of that pickup truck and they have AK-47s. And, and I don't know if you know what it feels like to have an AK-47 in your chest, but it's, it's not a pleasant feeling. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, then they, they had someone take our driver, throw him into the back of the van. And then they took over the van, went back down the road a little ways, and they came to a barbed wire fence, and then they went through the fence with the van, and there was a little two-track road on the other side, and this two-track went down, down, down into a ravine where they stopped, and then they took us out of the van one by one, frisked us, took all our valuables uh, off of us, made us lay face down on the ground, and then one guy's standing over us with a machine gun. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny feeling. You don't know if you're going to be able to wake up the next day, you know. And we could hear them going through all our stuff. And finally, they said, okay, we're going to leave now. Stay here for two hours or we will kill you. So we stayed there for two hours. I was, I was the only one that they did not take the my watch from I had a cheap Casio watch and they went in and take that one so I was able to tell when two hours got, came up and then we got up and gathered our things and tried to sort things out it was all a mess inside the van and they had taken they had taken my bird book they had taken my binoculars I mean I was out of business it was just incredible yeah they gave our driver back they didn't, they didn't hurt anybody really it turned out that we think uh, what happened is the military hadn't been paid in like two or three months. And they were looking for things. And uh, when we got home, uh, American Express had a message to call them immediately. Uh, and it looks like they charged like $4,000 in party supplies, electronics, and alcohol. And so they were just going for a big party sometimes. Anyway, we made it. That is a story that I think will conclude our session today. <laughs> Help me thank Steve for a wonderful time. Okay. All right. Thank you.